Employers, professional bodies, and educational programs each have a role to play in the management of workplace violence. The contributions of each are discussed in this unit. In addition to helping OTs working in these roles and organizations to understand their contributions in managing violence, this information will assist frontline OTs and students in knowing what to expect in the way of assistance and collaboration and what to ask for. Accreditation Canada, the body that accredits all healthcare facilities, has introduced a violence prevention program that outlines what providers need to show evidence of in order to be authorized to provide care. This program mandates organizations to be in compliance with all provincial occupational health and safety legislation related to violence prevention. In compliance with this program, AHS has an extensive list of bylaws and policies relating to workplace violence, as presented in their 2014 document entitled Workplace Violence Prevention and Response Handbook. The handbook contains detailed forms for assessing the risk of patient visitor violence based on patient-specific characteristics, as well as risks in the external and internal work environments, such as when working alone or in the community. A key component of Alberta Health Services violence prevention policy is the development of training programs. Several online courses are available via their My Learning link, as well as a hands-on nonviolent crisis intervention training program designed for workers who are at higher risk of violence incidents. Finally, all, employee, all employees involved in a violent incident are advised to access a variety of employee supports, a comprehensive list of resources and contacts for support for victims, as well as caregivers, co-workers, and managers is provided in the handbook referenced above. Follow-up with the perpetrator is also addressed. It is not clear if this handbook is directly available to individual occupational therapists and students. If you do not hear about these from your manager or professional practice leader, it is incumbent upon you as per the Essential Competencies document, to ask about them. Students should also consult their preceptors about it. For occupational therapists who are employers, Alberta Ministry of Employment and Immigration has a very informative document entitled Preventing Violence and Harassment in the Workplace to guide you in developing policies and protocols that will help make your practice safer for yourselves, your employees, and if relevant, for your students. On a more pragmatic level, listed here are workplace conditions that increase the risk of violence. Employees have a duty to monitor their, their workplaces for these and to address them as appropriate. They include inadequate staffing levels and supervision, use of extensive use of temporary and or inexperienced staff, demanding workloads, shift work, including to and from work at night, home visiting, particularly in isolated locations, poor security measures in facilities, and unrestricted movement of the public in clinics and hospitals. When violent incidents are reported and these factors identified, preventive action can be targeted whether through training and education of staff, through increased security, additional staffing resources, or something else entirely, focusing resources where needed. Systemic changes may also be required to address these situations, including the utilization of discipline-specific practice committees to address profession-specific issues, and or the equalization of power relationships in the workplace. OTs can be agents of change in the management of horizontal and vertical violence in their workplaces. This information is included to help OTs be aware of the role of their employers in preventing workplace violence so that they can better understand how they can be agents of change. For example, they can encourage employers to foster, foster a culture of respect and zero tolerance in the workplace. 
When violence is tolerated, messages are sent that it is condoned and that employees are not valued. A zero tolerance policy removes discretionary power, power from decision makers by making consequences mandatory. This approach supports the belief that violence is unacceptable. Hierarchical organizational structures have been identified as a key contributor to aggression in the workplace. The advent of program-based management has resulted in OTs reporting to a variety of health professionals who often do not understand their scope of practice and regulatory requirements. Employers can eliminate power imbalances between various professionals by ensuring structures and processes are in place that enable all healthcare professions to have a shared role in clinical decision making. Ensuring that disruptive behavior by all workers is addressed in a timely manner through performance management processes that include competencies related to promoting a violence-free workplace is also key. Employers must also ensure all employees and students have the knowledge and competencies required to promote a violence-free, healthy work environment. These are but the broad strokes of employer responsibilities in mitigating and managing violence in their workplaces. All OTs and OT students should be aware of their employer's responsibilities and should seek them out in their choice of job positions. Regulatory and professional associations and unions have overlapping responsibilities in mitigating and managing workplace violence. They are in pivotal positions to offer and indeed to hold organizations accountable for change on particular issues. For example, they can identify issues such as ethics, patient safety and satisfaction, and quality improvement. Collaborating with healthcare organizations on these issues results in the development of knowledge, practice, and ultimately a healthy workforce with optimal patient outcomes. ACOT, SAOT, and CAOT can have tremendous influence on occupational therapists through standards, best practice guidelines, continuing education, and other types of formal and informal dialogue. They create the expectations and culture of the profession and contribute to its health and well-being. The health HSAA can be particularly helpful with situations of horizontal and vertical violence because they are external to the organization and can investigate in a more independent manner than an internal human resource department can. Through outreach, role modeling, respectful behavior, and lobbying, these bodies can both collectively and independently leverage their power, position, and influence to foster healthy work environments. Please take a minute to review this slide. Early intervention in violence is key. Student occupational therapists who are taught how to identify violent situations are better able to recognize them early and prevent them from escalating. The Registered Nurses Association of Ontario provides the following recommendations for educational programs for the preparation of healthcare professionals in the management of violence. It is recommended that students be provided with a formal and informal opportunities to develop and demonstrate the ability to recognize, prevent, and manage violence. B, opportunities to learn how to protect themselves. And C, appropriate communication strategies for responding to conflict or escalating violence from patients. The universities must also ensure future therapists are informed about and adhere to health and safety policies and procedures related to violence as well as to relevant as well as relevant legislation. If students are not being provided this information and these these skills, it is appropriate for them to seek them out. <laughs>